Welcome to a Legendarium special about the extraordinary life of Jules Verne. In this episode, we will learn about the life of the man who gave the world some of its most beloved adventure stories. Jules Verne came into the world on February 8, 1828, in Nantes, France. Verne's family lived on Il Fédou, a man-made island in the Loire River. Verne spent his childhood watching ships sail down the Loire River and imagining what it would be like aboard them. When he was 11 years old, he tried to board one of the ships in secret, but his father found out, and that put an end to Verne's little adventure. At the age of 12, Verne fell in love with his cousin Caroline. He wrote poems to her, gave her presents, and attended dances with her. Caroline did not reciprocate Verne's feelings and married another man. Man. Verne's father, Pierre, a lawyer and a devout Catholic, always kept a telescope by the nearest church tower so he would always know the precise time of day. He also expected Jules Verne to follow in his footsteps and become an attorney. Pierre used Jules' heartbreak over Caroline to nudge him towards the law. Verne moved to Paris to study the law, but began attending Paris's literary salons and befriended a group that included Alexander Dumas. While living in Paris, Verne witnessed the fighting which overthrew the French monarchy in 1848 and then the coup of Napoleon III three years later. After earning his law degree in 1849, Verne stayed in Paris, not to practice the law, but to pursue literature. Within a year, Verne's first play, Broken Straws, appeared on the stages of Paris. He worked a low-paying job as a theater secretary, despite pressure from his father to practice the law back home in Nantes. Verne made several more plays, including Blind Man's Bluff and The Companions of the Marjolaine. In 1856, Verne fell in love with Honorine de Villan, a young widow with two daughters, after meeting her at the marriage of a mutual friend. They married in 1857. To support his new family, Verne accepted his father-in-law's offer of work as a stockbroker. Unfortunately, life in the office disillusioned Verne because he disliked how his co-workers obsessed over money. In 1861, the couple welcomed their only child, a boy named Michel, into the world. Unfortunately, Honorine took no interest in her husband's writing, which caused their marriage to cool. Verne also struggled with being a father and began avoiding home by spending time with male friends. His literary career also stagnated until he met publisher Pierre Jules Hetzel. Always a voracious reader, Verne spent much time at the Bibliothèque Nationale, reading scientific journals along with works of literature. Verne lived in a time of rapid development, when new things like the coffee pot, the telegraph, and the sewing machine were being invented. This informed his writing, which paid attention to technical innovations used by his characters. This foreshadowed the hard science fiction written by later authors like Michael Crichton. In 1863, Hetzel published Verne's first successful novel, Five Weeks in a Balloon, a story about three men who fly across the continent of Africa in a hot air balloon. Hetzel envisioned this not as one novel, but the first in a series known as Voyages Extraordinaires. Soon after, Verne agreed to submit new works every year which would be serialized in Hetzel's magazine. Magazine. The books now came fast, including some of Verne's most recognized works. In 1864, Verne published Journey to the Center of the Earth, the story of three men who enter a cave and continue traveling through it until they reach an extraordinary world at the center of the Earth, which included dinosaurs from millions of years ago. 
However, in 1865, Hetzel refused a Verne book called Paris in the 20th Century. It depicted an over-commercialized Paris in the year 1965 that is overcrowded with traffic caused by automobiles, badly polluted, and filled with homeless people. The publisher rejected it because he found it too far-fetched. Yet that same year, Verne published From the Earth to the Moon, which told of a group of scientists who built a gigantic cannon in the state of Florida and use it to fire the first space shuttle into the atmosphere, which then orbits around the moon. Inspired by his love of adventure, Verne bought a ship which he called San Michel after the sun he often neglected. He and his friends spent a good deal of time sailing to ports around the world, which provided plenty of fodder for his novels. In 1867, Verne traveled with his brother to the United States. He only stayed a week, but managed a trip up the Hudson River to Niagara Falls. His visit to America made a lasting impact, and this showed in his later works, many of which featured an American cast. In 1869 and 1870, Hetzel published Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which told the story of Captain Nemo, a man who grew disgusted with the cruelty and greed of life above the water, so he built his own world in a submarine that allowed him to find freedom under the waves. By this point, publishers translated Verne's works into English, and he could live quite comfortably on his writing. Beginning in late 1872, a serialized version of Verne's famed Around the World in 80 Days first appeared in print. The story of Phineas Fogg takes readers on an adventurous global tour. It pointed out that means of travel had become so sophisticated that it was possible to travel around the world in 80 days, something unimaginable only a generation ago. It became a worldwide phenomenon. Celebrity journalist Nellie Bly replicated Phineas's journey around the world in a balloon while fans could play a board game inspired by the book. As he earned more money, Jules Verne replaced the Saint-Michel with a larger boat that he fittingly called the Saint-Michel II. A few years later, he bought the Saint-Michel III, a steam yacht with a ten-man crew. Throughout the decade, Verne wrote other novels like Michael Stroganoff, Dick Sand, A Captain at Fifteen, and The Mysterious Island, which tells the story of a group of Civil War prisoners of war who escape from a Confederate prison in a balloon and then arrive on an island where, through ingenuity and hard work, they recreate all of the wonders and comforts of industrial America. Despite working through the 1880s, Verne faced more and more trouble in his personal life. Though his marriage bettered with his literary success, Honorine insisted on moving to Amiens, where her own family lived. Verne disliked life in Amiens and began frequently traveling to Paris to, as he put it, read prose. In fact, he began having dalliances with a mistress whom he kept hidden from his wife. He also had to send his rebellious and increasingly delinquent son Michel to a reformatory in 1876. A few years later, Michel caused more trouble through his relations with a minor. One year, Verne had to pay 200,000 francs to clear Michel's debts and legal fees. And in 1886, Verne's nephew Gaston shot him in the leg, leaving Jules Verne with a limp for the rest of his life. And on top of all of these misfortunes, his longtime publisher Hetzel died only a week after the shooting, and the following year his mother and mistress passed away as well. Verne's works took on a gloomy turn, unsurprisingly. Robert the Conqueror, for example, features a scientist who constructs a heavier-than- aircraft called the Albatross on a secret island. He travels the skies, flaunting his power and taking revenge upon the people who wronged or insulted him. And in the sequel, Robert the Conqueror uses his power to become a tyrant over all the nations 
nations of earth, utterly corrupted by the power that he created. This harsh character study is a far cry from the joyous and light-hearted adventures of his earlier work. Other books like Master of the World and Propeller Island warned of the grave dangers of men misusing technology. Thankfully, Verne's later years saw him reconcile with his son Michel, who began managing his father's unpublished manuscripts. Verne also served on the city council of Amiens, where he founded the city's first permanent circus. Sadly, beginning in his 50s, diabetes began taking a toll on the old man, eventually causing him cataracts. Jules Verne finally died in his house on March 24, 1905. Michel published several more of his father's manuscripts over the following decade, including The Lighthouse at the End of the World, The Golden Volcano, and The Chase of the Golden Meteor. In all, Verne authored more than 60 books, including the 54 novels that make up his Voyages Extraordinaires. He also imagined many innovations years before their time, including the submarine, space travel, terrestrial flight, and deep sea exploration. Often called the father of science fiction, Verne is the second most translated writer of all time behind Agatha Christie, his books in 150 languages. Languages. His musings on science sparked the imaginations of writers, scientists, and inventors for over a century, which ensures his everlasting fame. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.